Hello, and welcome to Green Dragon, a monthly show where we talk about green initiatives in Maryland, Howard County, and Howard Community College, plus ideas and ways for you to be more sustainable at home. I'm Bob Marietta, HCC's Environmental Health and Safety Supervisor, and I thank you for watching today. My guest today is Mark Sutherland, environmental consultant who started and has served on most of the conservation organizations in our area, and most recently co-founded one called Safe Skies Maryland. So Mark, can you tell us what brought you to Maryland and Howard County in particular? Sure, Bob, again, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I came to the Washington DC area because my father worked in the Kennedy administration many, many years ago. And um, so I grew up, um, in the area. Um, and then of course I went off to school and then I came back to Maryland specifically to do my postdoc at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Edgewater. And that made me a Marylander. And from there, um, about the time I started a family of two children, we uh, moved to Columbia. And that was really because of the Rouse vision, you know, the idea that it would be a great place to grow people and, and raise a family. Well, we're glad you're here with us, okay. <laughs> what, what was it, Mark, that first got you interested in, in, in ecology and in the environment? Well, you know, it goes back probably to my first memories. I mean, as a very young child, I was playing in streams, you know, catching frogs and crayfish and just always knew that I was interested in animals in the natural world. So that's really how it started. Um, and from, you know, I guess as I grew up, you know, you decide what you're going to do with your life and you're going to school and you say, well, what do I want to learn? And with a lot of other opportunities out there from astronomical engineering to, you know, other subjects and uh, literature, I, all of which I liked, what did I really want to learn? And it was about the natural world. So I was very early adopter to being a, a biologist, even when I was uh, basically a preteen. Well, it's been to all of our advantage that you did make that choice. Can you Thank share you. with us what are the names of some individuals and organizations mm -hmm. whose works have served to guide you on this in your career? Again, I've been very fortunate. Um, uh, as I mentioned graduate school, it was at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and my advisor was Nelson Harston. And you know, so those of you that know the you know, beginnings of modern ecology in the US, he was one of the leaders uh, of that group. So I was, you know, had a very good mentor, um, really taught me you know, uh, how to do science and, and value the natural world. So definitely Nelson was a key one. And then I'll just mention that I had also very fortunate um, to get 30 minutes with E.O. Wilson. Those of you that know of him who passed away in December that, uh, of last year, that he was, uh, you know, probably the preeminent evolutionary biologist since Darwin and is the, really the father of the concept of biodiversity and many other topics. So I had my 30 minutes with him as a grad student and just seeing his grace as well as his intellect inspired me to, to continue to work in science and do what I can for the natural world. Fantastic. So, Mark, tell us about Safe Skies. What is it and what are the recent legislative successes the group has achieved? Sure. So, yeah, yeah. Safe Skies is a small organization. We are a unit of the Maryland Ornithological Society. But um, while we're small, we're really, you know, laser focused on protecting birds specifically from bird window collisions, which most people have heard of. Uh, but really don't understand the full implications of. So it's a group that now we're about, about six uh, years old, um, and it really grew out of uh, the Howard County Environmental Sustainability Board. Uh, you mentioned you know, that I was chair there for a number of years, and what we did with that group was create task force, you know, basically ad hoc groups to focus on new and emerging issues that we thought would be important to the county and to the state and to the nation perhaps. Um, and in this case, you know, I, I had this concept about it. Uh, I had worked for Maryland DNR as a consultant and knew about the issue of bird uh, building collisions and the fact that it was one billion deaths a year, which is an astounding number. So, you know, after doing the task force, learning about it, recognizing that there's various things that needed to be done, um, you know, outside of the purview of the board, we, I created this nonprofit with Carolyn Parza. And um, so we have that group now and we continue to be very active. Yeah, and it's, well, it's had some recent legislative success. Could you tell us a little bit oh, about yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's who we are and what we've done. 
So we, we work on all three levels, you know, from the grassroots education to getting individuals to do what they can do to the organizations that own and operate buildings, which again are the things we're trying to uh, modify to be safe. And then at the legislative level, because as we all know, uh, when you have rules in place and guidance in place at a, a governmental level, you can have the most impact. And so we have been very fortunate that we've worked hard um, in July of 2020, uh, the Howard County Council passed and then the uh, executive signed. So thanks to Deb Young for being our sponsor. Uh, it passed four to one and the executive ball signed it. So we do have one of the first bills. Well, actually, probably along with New York City, the first bill on the East Coast to make bird safe buildings. That building, that bill requires all Howard County buildings of a certain size, excluding certain buildings, um, to be bird safe going forward. So that was a major effect, and it will be, you know, uh, it'll be saving birds. It's you know from from day one, uh, and it's been saving birds. So uh, the other success in the long hard road was to pass a bill in the Maryland uh, General Assembly. So we've been working on that, and we passed it this uh, April 10th, 25 minutes before the end of session at Sign and Die. Um, so we have a bill now in the state of Maryland that says buildings that are new or major renovations uh, and are paid for by 51% by the state of Maryland will also be bird safe. So really proud of those achievements, you know, but we're not stopping there. We have more work to do, but uh, I just thought I'd say that, and it's time to celebrate and, uh, those achievements. Well, Mark, I've heard, a, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but there's a myth going around that what mm -hmm. really got safe skies off the ground was a group of fourth graders who came and talked to the sustainability board. And uh, they certainly is, helped us is, out. Is this a I true mean, rumor? It's, it's definitely part of the story. So, you know, um, you know, my personal story was, as I said, I had knew of the issue and it sort of was in the back of my mind hidden away for about 10 years. But then when we started building the, you know, we worked on downtown Columbia, uh, many of us, you know, in the environmental community to make sure it would be as green as possible in its redevelopment over the next 30 years. And then when the first big glass building went up, it, it hit me that, okay, we're going to create a haven for animals and birds in particular to migrate to, and then they will fly into window glass and die. And that was just a super tragic concept. Um, so that was my parallel, but parallel at the same time, what unbeknownst to me and, and they unbeknownst about what I was doing, four graders uh, with the Lego team um, had already latched onto this. So we brought them in and, and joined forces uh, with the Sustainability Board's task force that I mentioned before. And they certainly played an important role um, in reaching out to the government. And um, so, you know, that was just a follow on to that to show that this is obviously important in the future generations. Um, Felix Baum um, has been a talk, uh, basically a champion for us. So he was a fourth grader and he's no longer fourth grade. I think he's a sophomore. Um, and so he spoke at the legislative breakfast for the board. And he also had him speak just this last year at the Maryland General Assembly for their environmental summit. So we have taken with that uh, fourth, fourth graders started and continuing on today. That, that's just incredible. And uh, yeah. more, more power to our youth. You know, I, Absolutely. I mean, it's really impressive when they get involved. Mark, can you point to any tangible evidence that your evidence, that your efforts are producing the results you want to see? Well, there's still a long way to go because really it's about the number of buildings that are safe, right? Or the, or stopping new buildings that will be super dangerous. The, the growth of glass buildings, which we know is growing rapidly, um, especially the ones that are not even windows, they're just uh, facades for aesthetic reasons that are very dangerous to birds. And those on this call may not uh, know the real true details, but basically birds see a reflection of sky or trees, and they will fly to it thinking that it's nature instead of a glass window. They don't recognize that uh, it's glass, uh, and humans don't either if we don't see the frame around it. Um, so the idea is, is that you know, we're trying to incrementally deal with a, process, a problem that's across the landscape. You know, There's no single valve you can turn to stop it, but you need to address each building. So new buildings are super important, but old buildings are important too. So I'll speak about the fact that we have retrofitted successfully some buildings and reduced bird deaths. Uh, my own house here, um, here in Columbia, uh, I kill birds, you know, uh, over the time, wood thrush, you know, it's super sad. Um, Swainson's thrush had flown into my window. So I put up a copian bird savers, which are these uh, paracord strings that you hang down and zero bird uh, collisions since I've done that. So 
that's you know i can see even in my own house i've been saving birds and i'll give you another example uh, the Taws uh, building in Maryland headquarters for Maryland Department of Natural Resources um, has had their windows treated by saving. They've done copian bird savers, we've done decals, and they have a long record of bird deaths there, um, hundreds and hundreds of all different species, you know, including raptors um, and woodcock and hummingbirds, all have been dying in their building, and now those numbers are going way down. All the records, all the evidence out there from places around the world that have treated their windows, made their buildings bird safe, have been more than 90% effective. Um, and so that's really encouraging that we know the solution works, we just need to apply it. Uh, it's, it's, it's great that we can actually make such a difference. Okay. So what, why are migrating birds so important to ours and other ecosystems around the world? That's a great question. Um, I mean, many of us you just love birds because they are beautiful, they are just wonderful. Um, to enjoy, but they really are a key part of the ecosystem. There are so many different species, so many in number, you know, 10 billion in the United States alone. Um, so they serve a variety of what we call ecosystem services. I mean, they're really important, obviously, to the food chain, um, be part of the web of life, but they also specifically uh, provide pest control. They eat a lot of pests. Um, they also provide pollination for a variety of, of, uh, of flowers. Um, so they're really important in those regards. and. You know, while I said at the outset, you know, we just love them because they're wonderful, that uh, constitutes an economic benefit to the state of Maryland. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent every year in Maryland alone on bird watching activities. So they're very important from that point of view as well. So it's uh, important to know that 29%, uh, we have 29% fewer birds in the United States than we did in 1970. And this is one of the major reasons why. So when we lose those birds, we lose those ecosystem services and we lose that economic benefit in addition to their beauty. Wow. And, and of course, if we, if we don't have the birds to eat the pests, we have to kill them with poisons and you know, all the impacts exactly. of that. So the alternatives, are, the non, non nature alternatives are, are, are not good. Yeah. Now I know safe skies works to influence legislators to get environmental legislation passed what did the group have to do to gather the information needed to convince the politicians? Right. So people, you know, like anything new, people don't necessarily understand it. So they want to get some information. So it was very important for us to provide fact sheets, to provide uh, documents. When we first went uh, before the county and the state with our proposed bill, we provided them with a book produced by the American Bird Conservancy, which has a great uh, glass collisions program and shout outs to them and Chris Shepard who's really helped us with that scientific background so that they could see visually and in numbers you know what the problem was and so th that kind of information was really important to have uh, there's a lot of science behind it um, it's really there's actually flight tunnels where a tunnel toward a window and you have two choices you have a standard window and you have one that's treated to be bird safe of course, you have a mist net in front of it so the birds can be stopped without it being harmed. And that can tell you exactly how often they would fly to a certain kind of window and you can determine a threat factor. And all that work has been done uh, originally uh, with uh, uh, Don Clem at Muhlenberg and now at the Bird Conservancy. And there's even a flight tunnel now um, in uh, uh, Chestertown, Maryland. So that science is there. So all that information was available to us and we developed it and disseminated it. But really, it took a lot of face-to-face -face work, you know, going in. And when we first started with the state, you know, going into the halls of the Senate, talking to Paul Pensky, you know, getting our sponsors on board. So getting the champions is obviously key. But the information that we had allowed them to, you know, have the ammunition to make the case. Well, I know uh, here on our campus, uh, the Safe Skies actually conducted surveys early in the mornings uh, and counted the numbers of dead birds found on our windows. And that yeah, I really haven't given kudos. I haven't given kudos to the college like I should. I mean, you know, you yourself have been very, very important to getting us off the ground because, as you said, here I'm providing all this background and scientific information, and people say, "Well, it's not a problem here in my state or my locality or my building," and it almost always is. It really always is. Wherever there's bird, bird uh, the buildings and there's birds, there's going to be fatality. So it's important to do the surveys, you know, doing those at the college were really important to show that. Uh, it shows that certain windows, and it has to do with, of course, the amount of glass, but also the reflectivity and also the 
the way the sun works and the way uh, different times of the day and different times of the seasons. So some are much more dangerous than others. Those that seem to be a, a fly through area, you know, if there's a building architecture that tunnels the birds to a certain place, they can be more, more deadly. So those are the most important ones to treat and you get that information from these surveys. Uh, for example, I mentioned uh, that there were surveys done, you know, here locally, we're doing them now at the courthouse, we've done them at other government buildings and we've identified other places, Robinson Nature Center, the Gateway Buildings and so forth um, that are having collisions and we're working to uh, treat those as well. Um, the Conservancy, Howard County Conservancy, a place where I'm on the board, you know, had, you know, it's obviously cares about nature and we built a new extension and down at the bottom level, there were bird collisions. So we did a variety of different treatments there at the Conservancy uh, based on the information that we had gotten and are now, you know, having almost eliminated uh, those, uh, those collisions there. So surveys are very important and thanks to all you and all the other folks that uh, help Safe Skies get them done. Well, it, it was important then and it's still important now that we continue these efforts. So what issues is Safe Skies working on now that Howard County and the state have taken the first steps for legislation for bird safe buildings? Yeah, so we're not stopping. I mean, we've had these successes at the county and state level, but you know, it's really about the number of buildings that are going to be safe for birds. Um, and so we need to move beyond just state buildings and move beyond just those in Howard County to other counties um, to address government buildings, but also private buildings and work also at the grassroots level. So <clears throat> in addition to working wherever we have an interested party to retrofit their buildings, and I mentioned some already, we're now working in Montgomery County at the uh, Parks Building. We're now working at uh, Salisbury University, places like that, uh, the Ward Museum, places that are interested in, in treating their, their windows to be bird safe. But on the legislative side, we're also working um, in other counties. You know, we're working in Anne Arundel. Currently, they have a bill before uh, their council to do a pilot study at the government buildings uh, in Annapolis. And we're working uh, you know, with other counties, Prince George's, Montgomery as well. So it's gonna continue. Every additional building that we get to be bird safe uh, will save birds. Fantastic. Is Safe Skies recruiting new members? And how would those who are interested get in touch? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, absolutely, we want, as I said, we're a small organization. The more people we have, the more we can get done. We do a lot of uh, public outreach. You know, we attend things like Green Fest and, and Earth Day events and so forth. And we basically show up wherever people want us. And, and it's getting, I'm getting more calls now. And maybe the state bill will help um, increase the calls that I'm getting. So right today, after um, this afternoon, I have a call with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Society, or Fish and Wildlife Agencies Association, to see what they can do. So people are learning about it, but we need more folks to help us. So certainly they can contact me or Carolyn. Um, uh, there's also a website on the Maryland Ornithological Society website. The Safe Skies have our own website there where you can contact us, but by email is probably the best way to do it. And we're happy to join you. We have regular, pretty much monthly meetings um, and people are, are welcome to attend that. All are welcome and appreciated. So, so Mark, what advice would you have for other organizations and individuals who want to make a difference in improving our environment? Yes, as I mentioned before, there's really sort of three levels here. One of what you can do yourself, like I did at my house, you can treat your own windows. And you'll feel good, you know, when you when you don't have birds uh, dying anymore, and that's relatively uh, easy to do and inexpensive. Um, also, you know, your business that you work at, or you know, any organizations you're familiar with, you can talk to the owners and talk to them about uh, retrofitting their buildings. And then again, as we we stressed here, the legislative level can be very powerful, and it really does make a difference when you write a letter, send an email, make a call to your legislator. It will make a difference. Again, I want to thank you know Terry Hill and our my personal Maryland delegate and Clarence Lamb, my personal uh, uh, Maryland senator who sponsored the bills that were passed uh, at the state level. Um, but getting champions like them, you know, happens because people care. And so if the constituents and other members uh, of, of Maryland, you know, contact them and tell them it's important. And I'll give this final example. Um, we had to convince the Senate president that this bill had a high enough priority. He was not against it. He just, you know, he has hundreds of bills to deal with. And I think it really was the additional um, uh, input and advocacy from hundreds of people. Um, Audubon joined in, Sierra Club joined in, and a lot of individuals joined in to contact him and other senators um, and got the bill through this year. So if it hadn't been for that, it wouldn't have happened. So 
everyone can make a difference. Thank you. So what sources of information do you recommend for folks who have an interest in ecology and the environment? You know, I can certainly point you to, you know, our websites about safe skies and bird safe buildings, but more generally, you know, the natural world is a wonderful thing. So almost anything out there, there's a lot of great books that have been written out there from a variety of uh, perspectives. And I'll just go back to um, E.O. Wilson again. Those of you who are not familiar with Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, um, really an important figure for a lot of reasons, not only the world's leading authority on ants, but also, uh, the, as I said, pretty much the inventor of the concept of biodiversity and sociobiology um, and you know, a lot of important things in evolutionary ecology. So he's got a number of books, many of them on my shelf, um, from biodiversity to something called biophilia, where he really talks about the affinity of people for nature and how we evolved that way. Um, so I would recommend any of his books. Um, so, th you know, that'd be one place to go, but you know, I just say, pick up a book about nature and read it. When I was a kid, you know, I just would pour over, you know, picture books of animals, exotic animals from around the world, you know, the iconic African elephants and giraffes and stuff, but also things like the eye eye, which is a strange lemur in Madagascar that I got to see a few years ago. So, um, you know, just pick up a book or upload a book and look at it and look at the pictures and, there's lots of ways you can learn. So can you look ahead now and predict out into the future uh, what the future for birds will be like if we if we do or if we don't continue to make bird safe improvements? What's going to happen to our environment? Right. So, again, this bird, you know, as I mentioned before, one billion birds die flying into window glass in the United States every year. And so they die across the world. And a lot of other countries are, are stepping up and doing research and beginning to institute their own solutions. Uh, uh, South Korea as a nation has passed a bird safe bills uh, law. So that's really encouraging. But as I mentioned before, in 19, since 1970, we've lost 29% of our birds. So almost a third of our birds are gone, which is just, you know, a scary, devastating thing. It's only going to get worse. Um, so we need to stop, you know, bird dangerous buildings from being built. We need to retrofit we have. Otherwise, those numbers will continue to decline because they face the many other threats as well. All of these things are, um, you know, amplifiers of, of, of decline. So, you know, we have to deal with pesticides. We have to deal with habitat loss. Um, we have to deal with feral cats, which are also a problem. So, but bird safe buildings is a solution is at hand where both the scientists and the green building people have put come together with solutions and, you know, treating windows works. As I said, 90, 99 percent. And so we can do that. And, and if we don't, you know, things will continue to decline and we'll have fewer birds out there and we'll have a, a poorer environment and less uh, ecosystem services for the human community. So what should I do if I find a dead or injured bird under my window? OK, um, you know, first of all, it's sad because uh, unfortunately, even birds that recover generally will not survive um, because it's head trauma. Um, but, you know, you certainly want to take any um, precautions you can. So if you have a bird uh, and you think it might still be alive, uh, the thing to do is to protect it from scavenging or predation. Uh, the reason that people don't see birds around their windows very much, they say, well, it can't be that many, right? How can there be a billion? It's because they're scavenged immediately at uh, dawn by crows and raccoons and cats and everything in a variety of different animals. Um, so if you find a bird that's stunned, um, you should probably you should put it in the paper bag, you know, very gently um, and bring the bag in to the house where it's warm, because if it's cold, they could you know die of exposure and just see if it recovers. And if it starts to move around, then you release it. And that's the best thing to do. <clears throat> if you have injuries and you want to, there are some rehabilitation centers out there. So there's one called Second Chance in Gaithersburg. There's uh, City Wildlife in D.C. that you could call and they can, you know, uh, uh, treat uh, some injuries. Um, and maybe birds can recover. But the simplest thing is just to protect it while it's um, unconscious and hopefully it will it recover and then just release it. Don't try to treat it yourself. You know, that's for professionals. <laughs> I, I know we, uh, in my office, we keep a uh, cat carrier, a cat cage. Uh -huh. And uh, okay. so when we find a, a, a bird, an injured bird that we think is worth, worth saving, we can transport it safely uh, to one of the rehabbers. And uh, so we're yes. always standing by to, to do that. Well, we have reached the end of our show. Thank you so much, Mark, for helping us and sharing this information with us. Is there any other information that you'd uh, li like us to know that 
Is there a way for folks to get well, in yes. touch with you? Exactly. Yeah. So again, we're we're encouraging anybody to join Safe Skies. We really will appreciate your help, and we're, it's all a community to move this forward and save birds. So both my emails and Carolyn's, um, my colleague at Safe Skies, are at gmail.com, and they're just basically our names. Mine is Mark M A R K dot T dot Sutherland S O U T H E R L A N D at gmail.com, and Carolyn's is Carolyn C A R O L Y N dot parza p-a-r-s-a at gmail.com so reach either one of us and um, we will be happy to get you on the team and give you information that you might need that's great thank you mark i'll be back next month with another guest and another sustainable topic in the meantime if you have ideas or comments you can connect with me at r marietta at howardcc.edu you can listen to this and all of our other episodes at greendragonhcc.podbeam.com. And you can also catch us on HCC TV and Howard Community College's YouTube page. Now, don't forget to share, like, comment, and let others know to join us and help us take care of our world. Because every small step each of us takes can have a greater impact when we all act together. Thank you.